pleasure to have you all here. It's a great pleasure for me to continue the Heller Lecture Series by the renowned scientist, great visitor who comes here for the second time. First time was when I was a student at the Department of Physiology. <coughs> So Carla received her PhD in neurobiology from the Harvard Medical School, where she studied with the Nobel Prize laureate David Hubel, about whom you all know, and Thompson Wiesel, and continued for the post with Kasper Rakic, uh, doing a, a continuous work on the same subject about which you will talk today, I believe. It's really leading from the beginning of the PhD till today. And this is really exciting to see a scientist who goes so uh, vigorously after her uh, ambitions, visions, and uh, great insight into the brain. Uh, unlike this, she moved around places from Harvard <laughs> to California, back to Harvard, back to California, something like this, yeah? So in 78, she moved to Stanford and then to UC Berkeley, I believe, and then back to chair the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard from 2000 to 2007, and then back to California to take a huge initiative, the BioX initiative of Stanford University, uh, an initiative which brings together something that we want to do here. Clinicians, biomedical uh, scientists, life scientists, together with engineers, physicists, computational scientists, they look not only at the brain, I believe, but at the whole body, right? In different disciplines, in different aspects of life sciences. It's a huge initiative to which I, which I evidenced when I visited the Stanford the Center and listened to stories about BioEx. I was completely amazed and I wish you continuous luck in what you're doing there. So, what I to continue and say that Carla was one of the pioneers who determined some of the basic principles of early brain development and activity-dependent connectivity. For the young generation, when Carla started her work, when she did her PhD, I was also a PhD student, and we really didn't know anything about all this. Really, the field was like we didn't know. We knew about HEP, okay? We knew about HEP. But you remember that that was a psychologist, not one who would go into the system and, and measure how is it that these things happen. So for the uh, younger, younger people here, Carla was the one who coined the term fire together, wire together. We are using it every day in theory when we do computational neuroscience. We are using your term. She found that even in the lack of behavior, in the lack of visual input, as she showed us very elegantly on Sunday, uh, before the receptors are even developed, before some of, when cells are still missing, there is also spontaneous activity which is critical for the wiring from the retina to FGN, and if I would generalize, activity dependent development. This is amazing for us to understand. So it's a real honor to have you here, uh, Carla is the head of lecturer of this uh, semester. And uh, with this, I would like to remind to all of you that the head lecture started by the great uh, friendship of a couple from England, the Heller family, Michael and Moby Heller, whom I met just months ago and learned from them that they will continue to support the Heller lectures and are very pleased with the way we work, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for allowing us to bring to you the great scientists of the present and hear such wonderful uh, lectures. Thank you thank very you. much, Carla, for being here. I would like to grant you this <laughs> Heller Lecture uh, okay. membership, the Heller Lecture Series in Computational Neuroscience, awarded uh, awards this certificate of recognition and appreciation to Carla Schatz for her contribution to academic inquiry and exchange at the Interdisciplinary Center of Neural Computation, Edmond J. Safra Campus, Jerusalem, Israel. Thank you Thank very you. much.
Well, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to be here. And uh, for those of you who are going to prepare to sit through a second lecture, thank you for coming. And uh, thanks to the Hellers, uh, because it's really a great pleasure to be invited to give more than, more than one lecture, actually. And these sorts of named lectures, uh, lectureships are, I know, very, very precious. And, uh, uh, and it's just great that you have another uh, a renewal of the uh, commitment from the family. It's great. So um, as I uh, told you all on Sunday, um, the, our lab is really interested in the question of how neural activity um, is uh, ultimately tunes up brain circuits. And of course, uh, it's those circuits that underlie our ability to perceive and to act and to function in the world. And this tuning up process, uh, as I told you, um, actually surprisingly begins even before sensory experience. It begins with a uh, set of spontaneous, act spontaneous activity that's present uh, not only in the visual system, which is what I discussed uh, on Sunday, but also elsewhere in the brain. And then as vision or other sensory systems begin to function, those replace spontaneous activity <coughs> and continue to tune up circuits so that ultimately neural activity uh, is driven by uh, sensory experience as opposed to internally generated spontaneous activity. Now, neural activity doesn't just tune up cells and circuits through the ether. Obviously, one of the questions is, how is it that neural activity, whatever the source, ultimately leads to lasting changes in synaptic structure and in the patterning of circuits in the brain? <clears throat> and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the idea that somehow activity has to function by altering the expression of subsets of genes that are somehow required for the circuit tuning. Now, obviously, activity also may function through uh, post-translational changes. Of course, it does. But what I want to consider with you today is whether activity, uh, and especially the early spontaneous activity present in the developing visual system, uh, alters gene expression. And if so, can we discover genes that might be required for activity-dependent circuit tuning? So that's what I'd like to discuss. And of course, I'm going to stick with our favorite part of the brain, the mammalian visual system. And the sets of circuits I want to talk about today are the connections between the retinal ganglion cells and their target neurons in the LGN, and in turn, the connections between the LGN neurons and their targets uh, in layer four primary visual cortex. <clears throat> and as I mentioned previously, these connections in the adult are highly organized and they're segregated so that the inputs from the two eyes are strictly segregated from each other. So ganglion cells in the right eye send their connections to right eye LGN neurons. Ganglion cells in the left eye send their connections to left eye LGN neurons and that forms a series of eye specific layers segregated. And in turn, the LGN neurons send their connections up to primary visual cortex where individual LGN neurons give, sitting in a given layer send their axons to interdigitate with those arising from LGN neurons receiving input from the other eye into a series of left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye patches in layer four that form the structural basis for the ocular dominance columns in higher mammals. <clears throat> and, you know, as I said, when, when, when you look at this pattern of connectivity, I think many people thought that this was hardwired. And I think this was one of the things that uh, in, in our lab was a rather surprising discovery that these connections are not initially present, but rather emerge over a period of development. And I summarized this in this little cartoon. And I spent most of my time in the lecture on Sunday explaining and giving you proof for why we know this. And this actually summarizes the PhD and postdoctoral work of quite a number of wonderful students who, as I said, now have their own labs. <clears throat> so in the formation of the eye-specific layers, the layers are not present initially. In fact, ganglion cells from both eyes converge onto common postsynaptic LGN neurons. And there's a period of activity-dependent synapse remodeling 
in which some synapses are strengthened and others from the other eye are eliminated. <clears throat> so both strengthening and elimination occurs during this period of development. And we know that this process of forming the adult pattern of connectivity requires activity because we, if we block activity, and I'm sure you, you know, we did this sort of ad nauseum together on Sunday where <clears throat> we first blocked activity in the LGN by blocking all voltage sensitive action potentials. We blocked activity coming from the retina by blocking retinal waves. I'm going to just mention that again in a minute. In any case, if you block activity, the eye specific layers fail to form and the immature pattern of connectivity remains. And the form of activity that's present during the period when the eye-specific layers develop is, as uh, was just mentioned, not visually driven activity. The rods and cones aren't present and they're not transducing light into a neural signal. But rather, the forms of activity present that are being sent to the LGN are spontaneously generated in the ganglion cells in the form of highly correlated retinal waves. And when we actually look at these waves using calcium imaging, you take out the retina and put it in a dish and load the ganglion cells <coughs> with calcium sensitive dyes like Flow or Fura. You could actually watch these retinal waves happen and I showed this movie. <coughs> and at this scale, what you can see is these are not huge waves that sweep across the entire retina. This is almost the whole retina of the developing ferret. But rather they're local and they're, uh, they involve highly correlated firing among neighboring ganglion cells. So this is the activity that we blocked, showing that when you block this activity, the eye-specific layers fail to form. So this is the early spontaneous activity present during development. Now, <clears throat> after the eye-specific layers form, the waves disappear, vision takes over, and at the next level of development from LGN to visual cortex, vision is required <clears throat> to continue the development of segregated inputs from the two eyes at the level of primary visual cortex, from the LGN to visual cortex. So what I want to talk about today <clears throat> is how does this happen and how is it that these patterns of activity are ultimately translated into lasting structural and synaptic change because that's what's happening, right? <clears throat> These connections are really functional at early ages and then remodeled. And I'm going to give you uh, more direct evidence of that. And so now a number of years ago, it occurred to us that trying to, in, in order to try to understand the molecular, some of the molecular mechanisms underlying this structural change, we might be able to conduct an unbiased differential screen looking for genes whose expression levels are regulated by this endogenous activity present in vivo during early development. <clears throat> so what we did is we used osmotic mini pumps and we infused at this age in development either to trototoxin to block action potential activity or a vehicle control. And we infused it for about 10 days during the time when normally the eye-specific layers would emerge. And then we dissected the LGNs either in the vehicle control or in the TTX treated condition, extracted the RNA, and then we did a differential expression, uh, differential expression study, an unbiased search for genes regulated by this early spontaneous activity. And to make a really long story short, uh, Rod Corvo and Jean Ho, when they were postdocs in the lab, discovered one really nice candidate gene. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. And we made a riboprobe again for this gene so we could validate that the expression actually is in the LGN. This gene was very nicely expressed. So here's an in situ hybridization for the mRNA. <clears throat> this is our favorite part of the brain, the LGN. It's nicely expressed normally during development and very much down-regulated when we infused a trototoxin, but not vehicle control. And here's where we got a huge shock because when we actually sequenced this and identified <clears throat> this particular candidate, we discovered that we were actually in the wrong, we were in the wrong system, period. We weren't even in the brain anymore. 
because this was a known MHC class 1 gene. This is, and I'm going to now tell you all about these MHC class 1 genes and their function in the brain and in neurons. So we really didn't find this particular candidate. It found us through this unbiased screen. Now, I, I know many of you, we, I, know, I know many of you know more cell, bi cell biology than we did when we made this discovery. In any event, these are the famous family, large family of molecules, the MHC class 1 molecules or the HLA in human, that are known, they're transmembrane proteins that in collaboration with a light chain known as beta-2 microglobulin, and by the way, this light chain is required for stable cell surface expression of the vast majority of MHC class 1 genes. It's not an MHC class 1. Some people get confused. <coughs> it's, a, it's actually uh, 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 like a chaperone. It's part of the MHC complex, but it, co it, it collaborates with many of the MHC class 1 proteins and is required for stable cell surface expression. So it's a protein, not a nucleic No, it's, this is a protein, right? It's no, it absolutely. Nucleic. No, no, this is a protein. We found, we found the RNA for it, the protein. And I'm going to prove to you that the protein is there too, but I haven't done it yet. So, the, so these are transmembrane molecules, proteins, that together with the light chain present peptide, either self or non-self, to circulating T cells that recognize this peptide <coughs> using the T cell receptor. So this is a famous system of immune recognition that's required for cell-mediated immunity, adaptive immunity. Now, the problem in a way with our discovery is that uh, we stumbled upon a dogma, the dogma being that the brain is immune, immune privileged. And part of the immune privilege in the brain was thought to be that healthy neurons do not express MHC class 1 proteins. But what I'm going to tell you today is that not, oh, I should also say, it's well known <clears throat> that after damage to the nervous system, and especially after release of cytokines, neurons are known to upregulate these MHC class 1 proteins. That's fine. But they were not thought to normally express MHC class 1. Now what I'm going to tell you today is that not only do neurons express MHC class 1, but that the protein is present at the synapse, that there are receptors in neurons for MHC class 1, not the, not the T cell receptor, <coughs> but innate immune receptors. One in particular that I'm going to talk about is called PRB, and that we think that this system of receptor and MHC class 1 is involved in the process of activity-dependent synapse uh, pr pruning and regulating activity-dependent synaptic plasticity. So I'm going to try to prove this to you. But by the way, when we made this discovery, actually when Rod and Jean made this discovery of MHC class 1 normally expressed in the healthy brain, the reviewers of our paper told us that they really expect, uh, respected work in my lab, but that we had made a fatal mistake. There must be a fatal flaw. In the, in the paper, and we should go back to the lab and figure out what we did wrong. So we've been spending the, ne you know, the next 10 or more years working on this problem, and I hope you'll agree that we didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> but you, know, you run into a dogma, and then it gets really fun and interesting and also really painful. Okay, so let me motivate this by one other really interesting piece of information. So when we first discovered that neurons can express MHC class 1 RNA and protein, I immediately went to PubMed and I typed in a few keywords like HLA and, you know, I wanted to know what disease might we be studying. And so I typed in HLA and Parkinson's disease or HLA and autism or HLA or MHC class 1 and schizophrenia. And this was, you know, like now 10, more than 10 years ago. <coughs> and so I got a, a paper that suggested that in a very small Chinese family, there was an association between certain polymorphisms at the MHC class 1 locus and schizophrenia. Now I got really excited and went back to my, you know, to the lab and I said, oh, whoa, you know, we might be working on schizophrenia. And then about three months later, I went back to PubMed and then I got typed in, and then I got another paper that said, 
lack of association between, anyhow, and this went on and on for many years, until 2009, when three back-to-back -back papers published in Nature, all, you know, uh, genomide association studies, so you can still say, okay, what does it mean? But all three, very much now more highly powered with, you know, uh, several thousand uh, uh, patients and controls. All three, they, they disagreed on a number of uh, polymorphisms, but there was one or two polymorphism SNPs right in the MHC class one locus of fairly high significance at that time. They all agreed was the most highly associated SNP in the MHC class one locus. And by the way, there are now a number of uh, studies in progress where the number of uh, uh, patients and controls is up to 30,000. And the significance now at the MHC class one has risen you know, by many orders of magnitude. So it's really getting to be extremely interesting. And, but, you know, it kind of broke my heart because when they found this association, they really didn't know, not, none of the three papers exactly knew what to make of it. So there was a lot of hand waving in these papers. And one of the comments was, well, it's known that uh, from epidemiological studies that there's an association between, um, immune dysfunction and particularly viral infection during the second trimester of pregnancy and later, you know, at, at puberty outbreaks, uh, I mean, uh, uh, major uh, uh, incidents, higher probability of schizophrenia in children that had been exposed in utero to like flu, something like that. And sort of a lot of hand waving. And it's known that, you know, there's other aspects of immune dysfunction associated with schizophrenia, for example. <coughs> Now, that can be true, but you still would have to ask, how, how would viral infection or any other immune dysfunction have an effect on the brain to cause a behavioral change that would lead to schizophrenia? So what, whatever, however it works, I just want to suggest that or hope that at the end of my talk, there, you have some ideas about really testable hypotheses for how this could work. And among them, I'm going to suggest <clears throat> that you don't need viral infection either, it could be, but also you could imagine that some of the polymorphisms actually might control aspects of development that themselves would lead to altered circuit development and circuit tuning that could lead to altered behavior. It's an idea, it's very testable. Now, um, okay, so uh, in, just as in human, the problem is that in mouse, there is, this is a huge and one of the most, maybe it is the high, most polymorphic locus in the genome. And in mouse, there are many, many MHC class ones. They're called both, they're both classical and non-classical. And among the classical are a few that the immunologists study very much and know a huge amount about. <clears throat> and they're ones that are known to present peptide to the T cell receptor. But there are many non-classical MHC class ones that have more restricted tissue distribution patterns, expression patterns, and much less is known about them. So as we started to read and we became more and more horrified with the size of the problem the first that we attack, we're going to tackle, we realized let's find out something about the expression patterns of some of these in the brain. So we did a bunch of uh, RT and qPCR experiments and we made some primers and we did some in situ hybridization. And I just quickly want to take you through at where we think some of these are expressed both at the RNA and at the protein level. But for example, in the cerebellum, one of these classical MHC class one um, genes is expressed in the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum, and another one, a non-classical, is expressed in the granule cells of the cerebellum. And if you look just throughout, you know, the cortex and the thalamus and the brain and so on, you see that, again, there are a number of different MHC class ones expressed in different patterns. For example, in, in the cortex, uh, this non-classical is expressed in the deep layers of the cortex. <clears throat> D is expressed in uh, layers two, three, four, actually and five of cortex, especially aficionados, this is barrel cortex here. T22 is expressed in deep layers. Some of them are expressed in the hippocampus in the substantia nigra, in other parts of the brain, and they're also rather dynamically regulated during development. Now, not only are the mRNAs expressed, but the protein is also expressed. So if you take hippocampal neurons and you put them in culture and grow them, then, and you let them grow and make connections, <clears throat> then what you find 
use an, anti an antibody that, by the way, we now know uh, recognizes only two, maybe there's a little recognition to a third, but if we look at knockouts, we can kind of characterize these antibodies. Then we find that uh, hippocampal neurons in their cell body and in their dendrites, and if you look at high power, in puncta in the spine associated with PSD95 puncta. So MHC class one appears to be expressed, the protein in the neurons associated with spines and close to synapses. And in order to learn a bit more about <coughs> the expression patterns, not just in cultured neurons, but in our favorite part of the brain, the LGN, uh, we took these antibodies and we started to use them on sections through the LGN at our favorite time in development, which is when the eye-specific layers are appearing in the mouth. So around postnatal day seven, postnatal day 10. And we were really brokenhearted to discover when we immunostained just, you know, standard immunostaining sections through the mouse uh, thalamus, LGN, that, you know, you could see kind of a fuzzy haze of staining that was specific because it wasn't there in the knockout mice. I'm going to tell you about the knockouts in a minute. <clears throat> but we really didn't have the resolution, nor do we have a good antibody that works in the EM. And so we were stymied until I realized, well, I went back to Stanford and immediately started to collaborate with Stephen Smith, who had just invented a new method uh, of high-resolution, light-level microscopy known as array tomography. And I don't really have time to go into it in detail, except to say that it's really cool using, um, using a special plastic embedding medium. It's kind of like EM. You can cut serial sections of many, many sections through your favorite structure in the brain. For us, it's the LGN. You can then stain with your first favorite antibody, let's say MHC1, and you can stain all serial sections. Then you can image, then you can strip, then you can stain your next uh, favorite antibody, let's say PSD95, then you can image, then you can strip, and you can do this up to 10 times or more until the actual plastic falls apart. So you have many, many rounds of staining, so you can look at co-localization of uh, proteins in your, you know, in, in your favorite structure in the brain. And using, two, two fo I mean, and using confocal microscopy, <coughs> you can obtain very high resolution images. So this is one very, uh, very thin section, a 70 nanometer section, looking uh, at three different markers, a postsynaptic marker, PSD95, a presynaptic marker, synapsin, and MHC1. And the first thing is you can see that MHC1 protein is present in the brain in, in, in puncta, and many of these puncta are co-localized in this thin section, either with a postsynaptic marker, a presynaptic marker, or sometimes, if you're lucky, all three markers. And in fact, there's a very high incidence of co-localization when you do the tomography. In other words, you reconstruct in depth many, many sections. So the results of this experiment suggest that not only is class 1 MHC in neurons, but it's localized at or very near synapses. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Kim McAllister lab did an EM study using uh, the antibody here. We're not so happy with the quality of the staining at the EM level, but they showed that uh, also you could, see mar you could see staining at the synapse at the EM level. I'm not that happy with the uh, quality of the staining, but still it's great. I mean, it supports our results and our ideas. Okay, so so far I've told you that MHC class one is regulated by activity. That's how we found it through this differential unbiased screen. It's expressed in neurons, it's located at synapses, and it's associated with times and places of synaptic plasticity because that's when we look for it. So here's the thing. Is MHC class one needed for synaptic plasticity? So I asked my mom who loved science. She's not with us anymore, but I like to invoke her presence. I said to her, Mom, <clears throat> how would you prove that MHC class 1 is actually required for synaptic plasticity? And my mother said, because she knew something, knock it out. But the question is, which ones? <laughs> and so we did a lot of homework. And you know, already know the answer because I just told you. I just showed you some of the answer. So we did a lot of homework, and we looked at expression patterns of some of them. And we found that both D and K are expressed in the LGN during the time of formation of the eye-specific layers and synapse remodeling. 
so at that time, I was actually at Harvard, and one of my neighbors was a very famous immunologist, Hidde Ple, and Hidde had made a double, a, a mouse doubly knocked out for both K and D. And since we didn't know which one, we went to Hidda and we said, can we have your knockout mice? And Hidda said, of course you can have our knockout mice, but I don't know why you want those mice, because they're not dead. And they run around and they breed and they have brains. And you know, for most developmental neurobiologists, this would be a tragedy. Because you know, if, you know, if, if, your, if your gene is really important, then the mouse is dead. But actually, for us, we were, well, we're also very much of a cup half full lab, but we're, it was really wonderful because when we had done the original experiments infusing the tetrodotoxin, the brain developed normally. <clears throat> there was normal cell division, normal cell migration, normal axon pathfinding, all the things I told you about in the last, in Sunday. And the only way we could tell that the brains that grew up without activity were different from the brains that grew up with activity was to actually literally label the axons from the eye to the LGN and see that the detailed patterning <coughs> of eye-specific layering didn't happen. So very local changes in the pattern of synaptic connections. And so we were happy the mice had brains. So what should we look for in these knockout mice? We should know the answer. So remember, the way we found MHC class one in the first place was that we discovered that it is normally the expressed at high levels and it's down-regulated in the LGN when we block activity. So maybe <coughs> the knockout mice would have a pattern of connections between retina and LGN more similar to the immature unsegregated pattern than to the mature segregated pattern. <coughs> so we can do a very easy experiment where we inject one eye with a green tracer and the other eye with a red, tr red tracer and we label all million ganglion cells in the right eye with green and those in the left eye with red and we look to see whether the eye specific layers are actually present or whether there's a lot of intermixing of the axons. So if we do this experiment in a mouse, in a wild type mouse, just after the layers have formed, we get a really nice green layer segregate, uh, sandwiched between two red layers. And again, for aficionados, in this case, the experiment was, we always inject green in the right eye, and this is the right LGN. So the right eye sends its ipsilateral connections to this middle layer, and the left eye crosses and sends its connections to the opposite side. Okay, and there's very little overlap of the two channels, red and green channels only a few yellow pixels here. When we did the same experiment in the KD knockout mice, <clears throat> what we saw was uh, a lot of pixel overlap. Uh, you know, there's still a fair amount of patterning of the LGN, but there's a tremendous amount of intermixing that persists. In fact, the occupancy, the, in, the overlap of inputs in the KD knockout is almost the same as the immature pattern of connectivity. It's about you know, 15 to 20% <coughs> of the area of the LGN is yellow pixels. So the results of this experiment suggest that either K and or D are needed for this kind of structural remodeling of presynaptic inputs to the LGN, right? So uh, yes, there's a so question. Were, were these light able to see? Yeah, they actually they can see, and I'm gonna talk about that. And so another logical question is, you know, do they actually make functional connections or is everything mixed up here, right? And that really begs the question, why do you have layers in the first place? Which is an interesting question and very likely has to do with getting the topographic maps in the two eyes aligned and set up uh, to create uh, neurons in visual cortex that are important for binocular vision and binocular depth perception. So I think the relevant question might be, for me would be, do these mice actually have good binocular vision and depth perception, which we don't know, but we know we, they can definitely see. Okay, so, but then let's go and ask, okay, so these synapses fail to remodel structurally, <coughs> but what about functional synapse remodeling? So remember that initially in development, individual ganglion, uh, yeah, individual LGN neurons receive inputs 
from many ganglion cell axons from both eyes. And later, they receive inputs from only one or two ganglion cell axons from one eye. So we can actually ask whether there's a failure to functionally eliminate synapses as well by doing whole cell recordings from LGN neurons. And then, uh, you know, you can cut a little piece of the LGN plus the optic tract. And then you can put a stimulating electrode in the optic tract <coughs> and stimulate at progressively larger uh, voltages, recruiting more and more axons with greater and greater stimulation strength. And you can ask how many inputs an individual LGN neuron receives by doing this kind of experiment. It's a really classic experiment first done at the neuromuscular junction to study the number of inputs an individual, uh, I'm looking at uh, um, uh, Lily now, <laughs> just to uh, study the number of inputs an individual muscle fiber or muscle would receive. And when you do that experiment in a wild type animal, as Han Mi Lee, who's a postdoc in the lab, has been doing, now she's turning up, you're watching a little movie, she's turning up the strength, the stimulus strength to the optic tract, and you see that there's a low threshold EPSC here, and then she recruits a larger input as well. And that's it. And that's the adult wild type pattern of innervation. So there are two inputs uh, in this, that this, this LGN neuron receives inputs from two retinal ganglion cells. But if you do the same experiment in a knockout mouse, then what she found is that there's a continuous sort of almost hard to resolve the number of inputs. So there are many weak inputs, and there's actually at least one strong input to this, L this LGN neuron. And this is actually really similar, if not identical, to the immature pattern of innervation. So the results of this experiment suggest that either K or D is needed both for structural and for functional synapse elimination. So somehow there's a defect here in this process of elimination or pruning of synaptic connections that seems to be somehow driven by these MHC class one, at least K and or D. Now, <clears throat> I don't have time to tell you that, but uh, we're now doing rescue experiments. So we want to know which one is it. Is it K or is it D? So we're doing experiments putting back one or the other and asking if we can then rescue to wild type <clears throat> and tune in. So I, I mean, it, I think we're going to be able to rescue. So I hope in a little while we'll tell you, be, be able to tell you more. Yes. <clears throat> Right, so, <clears throat> so with this, it, it's actually a wonderful question that right now is technically not possible because to do it, you have to stimulate from the nerves, not the tract. So you actually have to have both nerves attached in a prep to the LGN. And it's just right now not possible to get both nerves attached. And uh, you know what I mean? Because we're doing whole cell. I mean, and it's not like, um, I mean, you guys, some of you can do whole cell recording from, you know, layer five neurons and moving mice. <clears throat> These guys are that size, right? And the LGN is like a few millimeters. So it's not, it, it's not a trivial question. I don't mean to um, make excuses. I think it would be a wonderful experiment. And if you want to come and try, you're very welcome to. <laughs> It'd be really great. Absolutely. So all we can say now is that too many synapses are retained. But the cool thing there is, that's also very relevant for topographic fine-tuning of the topographic map. Okay, now, <clears throat> you should also have another question now to me. Yeah, there is another question. <laughs> is, is it the cells that actually do not, uh, some of them may grow normally, some of them grow up normally? Is it the typical uh, subtype of LGN cells or? I mean, okay, well, so, yeah, so, uh, I mean, the LGN neurons, <clears throat> in my opinion, the LGN neurons uh, really have no information about eye, about eye um, preference, which I, they have definitely information about positional information within the LGN that must be really important for setting up a topographic map. So EPH, efferens, efferens and EPH receptors, absolutely some kind of, they're sitting in a gradient or a few directional gradients. But in every experiment that my lab has done and other labs, you can, by various uh, manipulations, blocking activity, looking at genetically, you know, mutant mice, 
you can actually end up with these LGN neurons getting their input from the right eye or the left eye, you know, um, through manipulations that suggest there's no strict molecular preference. And I gave a lot of evidence for that in my talk on Sunday. Um, but there must be lots of other, there are many, many other molecular cues, but segregation according to right eye or left eye does not seem to be one of them. Okay, but there should still be another question. So, does, does it really mimic the CPA experiment? Pardon me? Does it really mimic the CPA experiment? It doesn't look up if you, for example, the pathology or, uh, I don't know, the structure? Yeah, the so this is, vi so the, mi so the, how similar is the uh, phenotype here to the TTX knockout? It is remarkably similar. It's amazing. And it's almost as if the immature pattern um, persists and is uh, exaggerated. But it's not quite as extreme as the TTX experiment. Okay? So, so that suggests that you may have other genes? Well, there might be other genes. There could very well be other genes. Although that's why this rescue experiment is really important. So how much can we rescue? <coughs> so we don't know. But we think, we think we can rescue a fair amount with one of these. So, I mean, and also you might be able to rescue a fair amount with the other one. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, there's still another question though. Because you could say to me, okay, well, the reason that you have this phenotype in the KD knockout is really pretty boring. because The reason is that the KD knockout retinas don't have waves. So if they don't have waves, they don't have activity, and if they don't have activity, of course they don't have layers, right? What we're trying to argue here is on the contrary. The layers don't form because these molecules are required for reading out activity and required for making decisions about which synapses to keep and which ones to eliminate. So the critical thing is to ask what about the retinal waves in the KD knockout mice? And so sort of fun, I reconnected with Marla Feller, who was a postdoc in my lab. So we are required the LGN No, I mean, they would be required at the, at the retinal level, right? Well, I, okay. <clears throat> so I just, gave, I just gave you evidence that these synapses are working, right? I showed you really nice physiology experiments. So they're working fine. In fact, uh, we can't really tell that they're very, very different from the wild-type synapses functionally, <clears throat> but they don't eliminate. So they work. So then the question is, is there actually spontaneous activity coming down the pike? That's the question. So we, um, we collaborated with one of her students, uh, Lowry Kirby and Marla Feller, and we looked at every parameter of retinal waves that we could think of, that they look at all the time. This is just four different parameters at different ages. And to make a really long story short, because I could show you many parameters, the patterning, the retinal waves are intact. The pattern is intact, the frequency is intact, um, the uh, developmental change from waves that depend on uh, acetylcholine to waves that depend later on GABA and glutamate, that all happens. So the activity, so this is very important, right? Because what it means is the retinal waves the activity coming from the retina to the LGN is intact, but in the absence of K, N, or D, it cannot be read out into a decision as to which synapses to eliminate. So it suggests and is consistent with the idea that K and D are downstream of activity, which is good because it's how we found them. We found them by blocking activity and then finding that these molecules were regulated. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to kind of now talk more about how MHC class one might work. And we were thinking a lot about how it is that this activity is read out at the synapse <clears throat> and what these molecules might do. And of course, many people think that in order to eliminate synapses, there has to be some kind of phenomenon of synaptic weakening present at the synapse. And in order to stabilize synapses, there has to be some phenomenon of synaptic strengthening at synapses. And so the question is really, is there, are these mechanisms actually present at the retinogeniculate synapse, LTP and LTD in quotes, because they may not be identical to hippocampal. And if so, 
are they intact in these KD knockout mice? Now, those of you who were here on Sunday know that in the wild-type mice, <coughs> there's a very nice timing-dependent synaptic plasticity rule at these retinogeniculate synapses. And just to remind you, what we've done is we've explored that plasticity rule using natural patterns of activity because, remember, we know a lot about the pattern of bursts of action potentials generated by the waves in the retina. We know a lot about the duty cycle, how often they happen, how high frequency and how long the bursts last. And what's more important, too, is that we, by recording, by making whole cell recordings from the LGN neurons in animals while the retinas are bursting, we also know the duration and pattern of the uh, excitatory synaptic currents that are generated by the waves. So now we can actually do a plasticity experiment using realistic patterns of activity, and we can pair postsynaptic depolarization with activity that's coming at the same time from the retina by simulating the optic tract at the same time that we depolarize the postsynaptic cell, or we can pair postsynaptic depolarization with activity that's not coming at the same time as the depolarization of the postsynaptic cell. In fact, let's say before. And we know the synaptic learning rule is present in the wild type, and in fact, if we do such an experiment in sync, pairing optic tract stimulation with LGN depolarization using this nice duty cycle of the retinal waves, <coughs> we can induce in wild type mice a very nice long-lasting potentiation of synaptic transmission. It's like LTD, LTP, but you know the mechanisms underlying might be different, but it's an LTP-like mechanism. And when we do the same experiment in the KD knockout mice, we find actually that LTP is intact in the KD knockout mice. On the other hand, if we do an experiment in wild-type mice where the stimulation to the optic tract occurs before the postsynaptic cell is depolarized, we can induce a long-lasting depression of synaptic transmission, a kind of LTD-like thing. And when we look in the knockout mice, we see that that's missing. If anything, there's a small but actually significant <laughs> sort of like LTP that happens. So this is just a summary of these effects. So LTP is intact in knockout mice, and in, LT, in knockout mice, LTD is, if any, is, is, not, is missing, or if anything, converted to LTP, but let's say it's missing. <clears throat> and that's kind of really cool because it actually suggests that these altered synaptic learning rules might be able to explain the failure of synapse, elimina synapse elimination in KD knockout mice. So if you cannot weaken a synapse, you cannot eliminate it. That would be the notion here. Okay, so the question is, why, you know, so this is, this is like the reviewers. That's why they gave us so much trouble. So you must know. <laughs> I know. So this is a really good question. So, you know, the question is, you know, could it be the influence of the immune system on the nervous system, right? And um, I'm, right, because, you know, it's a whole, this is a full body knockout, right? And these mice ha don't have K&D in their immune system either, and, and they're actually they're immune compromised. So I have a few answers to this question. But my first answer is, why do you think the immune system owns these molecules, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, so they, I mean, you know, obviously the neurons are expressing these molecules, but actually the, the rescue experiment we're doing now is gonna really make you happy because we're actually not only rescuing like one of the K or D, but we're only rescuing it in neurons, right? So we're gonna know. So we're going to know. So until we know, you're right. We don't know the answer, right? But I mean, as I said, you know, I don't see why the immune system has to own these molecules. Yeah. So you have overall more synaptic contacts? Yes, yeah. more, more synaptic contacts in these in these mutant mice. Yes, yes, exactly. Although there may be more weaker contacts, right? But there are more, exactly. Okay, so I just want to make because this is, goes to like in the mice see. This is the question. And so quickly, I just want to say that we've actually done a number 
of studies of these mice now, behavioral studies, where we don't have, it's actually so time consuming and, and expensive, and we're not behavior, mouse behavior people. And so we've actually collaborated with uh, uh, and paid to have experiments done by people who really know how to do these experiments. But it's really kind of amazing. These mice, at this point in terms of what you can study in terms of mouse behavior, do not appear to be impaired. If anything, they seem better off than wild-type mice, which I suppose is not saying much, since wild-type mice are probably, because they're raised in a lab environment, not in good shape. But <clears throat> they have amazing abilities to learn and stay on rotorot, to learn the rotorot task. Wild-type uh, are m not nearly as good. <clears throat> in fact, when we did these studies, the, our colleague who was doing them blind said, he called us up and he said, I know immediately which ones are the knockouts. And we said, yeah, which ones? And he said, they're the ones that are doing really badly. And those were the wild type. So the knockouts are better than the wild type in learning this task. Remember that, actually, I didn't tell you, but D and K are both expressed in the Purkinje cells, in the cerebellum. If you take one eye out uh, in a mouse during critical period of de development, uh, trying to then induce ocular dominance plasticity, and I'll get to this in a minute, and you look at the ability of the mouse to see through the remaining eye, then the knockout mice actually have better acuity vision in the remaining eye than the wild type mice do. <clears throat> and the knockouts also have enhanced recovery from stroke. Somehow they're protected from stroke. And by the way, in the wild type, the levels of expression of K and D are increased tenfold in a um, MCAO model of stroke. So, uh, I'm sure there are impairments, uh, but we just haven't found them yet. All right. Do you have any idea why yeah. it happens? Because they are better at... Well, so the idea, uh, I think I can answer this in the next five minutes. And the, re the reason is we think that because there are more connections, there are not just more connections in the LGN, but also in the visual cortex, and that gives the mice uh, enhanced ocular dominance plasticity. They actually have more plasticity than the wild type mice. And that may actually allow them to uh, compensate uh, for the loss of one eye in a more effective way. So they are, they are ge generalists as opposed to specialists? Yeah, maybe they're generalists or maybe they're not. You know, Maybe they're specialists and they're more like a high functioning autistic. We don't really know, right? Maybe they're like an idiot savant. I mean, it really isn't clear what they're like. Okay, so now I just want to spend a few minutes sort of considering with you how MHD class one can work by taking another tack, which is it occurred to us that, that if MHC class one is really at the synapse in neurons, then maybe there are neuronal receptors, maybe even on the other side of the synapse. This is our um, fantasy. And that these might be also met receptors that are also not supposed to be in the brain, but are well known to bind and signal MHC class one in the immune system, but not the T cell receptor, because it's well known that the T cell receptor cannot be found in the brain except for on T cells that are coming in and out of the brain. But what about other innate immune receptors? So these are phylogenetic, these are earlier receptors. They're important in the innate immune system. So at this point, Josh Sykin and Tadja Grandpre conducted this time a in situ hybridization screen looking for expression patterns for some of these innate immune receptors that were interesting. And actually we found a number that were interesting in the brain. And then we, we went to get antibodies commercially available at that point to kind of validate them. <clears throat> and at that time, I mean we actually saw some nice expression of some of these, but I want to tell you about one in particular which is called PIRB, P-I-R-B, or L-I-L-R-B in the uh, human brain, or in <coughs> and PIRB in the mouse. And just to tell you what PIRB is, it's a member of the Ig superfamily. It's a transmembrane receptor that has a bunch of Ig domains and then has these uh, very characteristic ITIM motifs, these in immunoreceptor tyrosine-based inhibitory motifs. And what was really interesting to us is not only that there was a very nice protein expression pattern in neurons, I'll show you in a minute, but also that when these itins get phosphorylated, they recruit <coughs> phosphatases that in the immune system were then known 
to oppose signaling cascades, adhesion and kinase cascades, like MAP kinase cascades, um, that in the brain are known to be required for synaptic plasticity. So this is not, obviously this isn't known yet, but the, these, it, we were very interested in this idea of these signaling cascades and how they might also work in the neurons. So because of that, um, and because the protein is present in neurons, so if you take cortical neurons and you put them in a dish and you grow them, then early on you stain for peer B, then you see this beautiful immunostaining in the growth cones of neurons in the, in the palm of the growth cone, just behind synaptic vesicles and the actin uh, cytoskeleton. If you let the connections grow a little bit in the cultures, you see this very nice punctate staining for peer B that isn't quite exactly, except at occasional places, localized with synapsin staining. So there's some relationship to synapses. And if you look in the brain using an antibody to peer B, then you see very beautiful immunostaining, particularly of cortical pyramidal cells, pyramidal cells in the hippocampus, Actually, the granule cells in the, um, in the cerebellum, amazing staining in the olfactory system and so on. So because of this expression pattern and the properties of PRB, we decided to make a knockout. So Josh made a knockout. And so what should we look at in this knockout? So I said to my mom, Mom, what should we look at in this knockout? And my mom said, you should look at whether or not the LGN layers form normally. So that's exactly what Josh did first. He looked at the LGN layers, and guess what? They looked normal. And then we realized there's very little expression of pure B in the LGN or the retina that we could detect. So you know, we probably should have looked at that first. But there's beautiful expression of pure B actually in the hippocampus and in and primary visual cortex. And so we realized we should look at another very beautiful example of activity-dependent plasticity, experience-dependent plasticity, which is the change in, these, in the segregation of the inputs from the LGN axons, this is this ocular dominance plasticity, that can be induced during a critical period of development by closing one eye. And when, that, when you do that, the connections from the other eye take over more than their fair share of territory within primary visual cortex. It's the LGN connections that are changing here. And uh, just to remind you of a famous experiment by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, if you label the connections that represent one eye with a white tracer and you look down on primary visual cortex, you see these ocular dominance columns or stripes. And in normally reared animals, they are normal size. So if you inject, let's say, the right eye with a white tracer, these stripes are of normal size in both eyes. So they're the same width and it's about the same territory, 50-50. But if during a critical period of development, you close one eye for a brief period of time or you take one eye out for a brief period of time and then you inject the open eye with a tracer that goes across the synapse in the LGN up to the uh, visual cortex, you see that the representation of the open eye has expanded. This is a beautiful example of use it or lose it during these critical periods of development. And by the way, if you do this experiment in the adult, there, once these uh, stripes are formed, they're stable. So in the adult, if you take one eye out or close one eye, these stripes are stable. And incidentally, that's good because when, if you have a cataract in the adult, in a, as an adult, if one eye, if the cataract is repaired, you can see out of that eye again. So this is a good thing. So there's a critical period. And it turns out oops, that mice have a critical period, just like monkeys do in this case, except the whole mouse visual cortex is about this size in relation and scale. So it's a very little visual cortex, but there's like one ocular dominance patch, and here it is, and you can see it using uh, the, a technique where you activate immediate early gene expression. So you can close one eye and then have the mouse run around in a room for half an hour looking only through the open eye. <clears throat> and that functionally turns on this immediate early gene in all the neurons that are getting their functional input from the eye that's open. So it's a very easy way of testing which neurons are connected functionally to the open eye. And if you do that experiment in a wild-type mouse, you get this nice region of activation. If during the critical period you take one eye out for about a week or so, 
and you do the same experiment, you notice this area has increased in width. So that's a very nice example of ocular dominance plasticity. So what would happen in these peer B knockout mice that don't have, if we do the same experiment in the knockout mice? So we figured, okay, if they don't have peer B, they shouldn't have any plasticity. So even if you take an eye out and you try to induce plasticity, you'll just get the wild type pattern. To our huge surprise, <coughs> what we discovered is that these peer B knockout mice actually had more plasticity than wild type. So in other words, peer B is functioning somehow as a break on plasticity. And I want to sort of come back to that at the end. And we can measure this, sort of quantify it. We can scan these sections blind to genotype. We can measure a plasticity index. And this index just basically says that in the peer B knockout mice, during the critical period, there's more plasticity than in the wild type mice. Now, what's also kind of interesting is that in these knockout mice, this enhanced plasticity doesn't totally disappear by adulthood. In other words, the critical period doesn't close completely. So in, if you look in the adult, you do the same experiment in the adult of taking one eye out or closing one eye. <coughs> in wild type adult, there's almost no expansion of the remaining eye, no plasticity. But in the peer B knockout, there's actually still some plasticity present. Now granted, it isn't as much as during the critical period, but as I get older, I'm happy to take this extra plasticity and do something with it for myself. <clears throat> and presumably, this is also the kind of plasticity that might be present you know, in an adult brain enhanced after stroke and could help with recovery from stroke, something like that. So we wanted to study this in a little more detail. So, this is interesting, the fact that peer, without peer B function, there's more plasticity in wild type, reminded us of a very nice experiment that was done a number of years before by Mark Hubenier and his lab, in which in an effort also to create more plasticity in the adult, they reasoned that prior experience might lay down a trace that could be tapped into again in the adult. And that might enhance plasticity. And what they did is simple. They closed one eye during the critical period, engaging ocular dominance plasticity. Then they opened that eye in wild-type mice, and, and, and there was recovery of that eye until adulthood. And then they closed the eye again in adulthood. And lo and behold, they found that there was about twice as much plasticity as present in wild-type. After this, prior experience, this conditioning effect. And this is well known. It doesn't just happen in the visual system. It can happen in the auditory system and so on. And what was interesting is this, uh, this effect is about the same magnitude as present in the wild type mice. And they went on to do another beautiful experiment. They asked, is there a structural trace of this functional conditioning effect? And they did a beautiful experiment where they took mice and they looked to see in pyramidal cells whether or not there were changes in spines on the apical dendrites of layer 5 pyramidal cells. So they got these beautiful Phi-1 YFP mice, and they looked at the layer 5 pyramidal cells, they looked at their apical dendrites, and lo and behold, what they found is when they did the first conditioning during the critical period, they closed an eye, spine density <coughs> on the apical dendrites increased and then amazingly, when they opened the eye, even though there was functional recovery, those spines remained. So there was an increase in spine density that became stable. And they proposed that that could be a kind of structural trace of the early experience that could then be re-engaged with the second eye closure. So it occurred to my postdoc in my lab <coughs> that maybe there's something funny about the spines in peer B knockout mice. So we crossed our mice to the Thai-1 YFP mice, and she looked, and amazingly, I think, we were really surprised. What we discovered is that there is a stable uh, increase in, in relation to wild type in the number of spines on the apical dendrites of pyramidal cells in the peer B knockout mice. And that's present not only in the adult, but actually uh, when we looked also during the, peri the critical period suggesting that peer B somehow negatively regulates spine density so, and might be really important for what? Spine elimination 
during postnatal critical period development. Now I'm actually going to summarize. Oh, and I also have to say that we also know that these spines are associated with an increase in excitatory synaptic connections because if Maya controls, uh, co records miniature EPSCs, spontaneous EPSCs from the layer five pyramidal cells, she sees a significant increase in the mini EPSCs in their frequency but not their amplitude. So we think that these are you know, not just sitting around spines but they're actually the site of an increase in functional excitatory synaptic connections. Okay, so now I am actually going to summarize. So um, the results of these experiments suggest that peer B is somehow required uh, for regulating synaptic, or maybe even breaking mechanisms of ocular dominance plasticity in visual cortex. When you knock it out, you get more. And also regulates in some way uh, spine elimination during development. And I hope this reminds you of anything because it should remind you of the phenotypes we also saw in the LGN, in the KD, the MHC class one knockout mice, which remember, we're proposing in our model that MHC class one is a ligand for peer B. And so if that's correct, <coughs> then there are a lot of things that should be true. And one of them should be that the MHC class one, these KD knockout mice, should also have enhanced ocular dominance plasticity in the primary visual cortex. So we've now worked on those experiments, both during the critical period and also in adult. And indeed, we find that there's also, um, an, a, you know, again, completely unexpected expansion of plasticity after eye removal or eye closure in the KD knockout mice, sort of consistent with the idea that these things might be acting as ligand and receptor. Okay, now I am really summarizing. So we have a kind of fantasy working model for how we think MHC class one and peer B could work. And let me just say that like most models, it's sure to be wrong, but at least it helps us you know, in our thinking about how, how things could work. And also, let me just say a few other things. We also think that peer B is really the tip of the iceberg. That is, as I said, we did see other um, immune receptors expressed in the brain. We just didn't have really good reagents to follow up on them. But since we published our this study of the peer B knockout mice and peer B, a number of other uh, uh, immune receptors have been found to be expressed in neurons. And they're being explored, not Li49. And um, as one of them, I don't know, maybe Li6 is important. Who knows? Kears, right? The Kears, exactly. So, uh, so it, it's clear that there may be that's just the tip of the iceberg, and, and, and honestly, maybe the reason, maybe there are other receptors expressed in the LGN, and that's, you know, if we could have knocked out the right one there. Okay, so we put MHC class one molecules actually postsynaptically, and we put peer B molecules presynaptically, and it's not just totally fantasy, right? But remember, we saw a very beautiful staining of uh, a protein in the dendrites and cell body and spines of hippocampal neurons and culture, not in their axons. And we saw very beautiful immunostaining of peer B in the tip of axonal growth cones during development. So we don't have good EM antibodies. So it could be that they're also working in other ways. But this is one idea is that maybe there's actually a transsynaptic signaling system that's regulating some aspects of the balance between stabilization and elimination and if so, it's kind of neat that maybe there's a system that's somehow functioning in this process of synapse pruning and plasticity. Whatever the case, even if we're completely wrong about the model, what I find fascinating is that these are present in the healthy brain. And what it says here is that somehow the nervous and immune system share a common molecular language. And in fact, the immune system can actually query the nervous system by checking out the state of these synapses uh, because, you know, the immune cells are coming into the brain and they have a bunch of these receptors, including the T cell receptor, and they can actually check out the state of the neuronal synapse. In fact, there may be a big joke on us that the neuronal and the immune synapse aren't as quite as different as we thought. But whatever the case, it could also be that MHC1 
uh, molecules are a, a missing li link in schizophrenia in two ways. One, it could be that these um, SNPs, the, the polymorphisms present that are highly associated with schizophrenia, might either be gain or loss of functions. I don't know which they are. But, you know, I've shown you that these molecules, at least in the mouse, the loss of function is controlling synaptic pruning. Wouldn't it be interesting if similar functions, alleles are, are controlling this in human development, and that can really change how the outcome of this pruning process and uh, experience-dependent circuit tuning. In addition, as many of you know, these molecules, the NHC class one molecules, are traditionally regulated by cytokines. So this is another way that you could imagine that some kind of abnormal or premature exposure to high levels of cytokines as an infection early on could in fact change expression levels of MHC class one at synapses and really shift the balance of LTP and LTD. And that could also change the outcome of this, pro this process of activity dependent synaptic tuning, which in humans, you know, continues extensively throughout life, but really up to puberty is, is, is happening throughout the brain. Okay, so really food for thought, fun to think about how one now might um, test some of these ideas or look for uh, the human condition in the context of what we know about MHC class one function in mice. And I want to thank over the years, many, many people who have contributed to this work, starting really with the discovery of the retinal waves and looking at synapse elimination normally in the LGN, and ending right now, we're really working hard. We've made a flox allele of tier B, conditional allele, and we're actually studying what happens when you acutely delete th this receptor at different ages in development, hoping that someday we can make a pill that you could take and induce more plasticity in your adult brain, at least, I mean, that could be good or bad. And then I also want to thank all of the people who have um, helped us or collaborated with us and uh, funding as well. So, and thank you so much again for inviting me to come here. And I've, I've just had a wonderful few days, and I've talked to many of you, so it's kind of fun to stand up here and see now very familiar faces in the audience. <laughs> so thanks again. And before uh, Carla has to go to Tel Aviv to get the prize, <laughs> We can have uh, just a question. So, no? the will be the same respectful as the one for my Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Right. Right. So, in fact, um, Mark Tessie Levine <coughs> did an expression screen looking for receptors that would bind NOGO and OMGP. And pure B, P I R B, <coughs> came out as a candidate that would uh, bind and signal. And you know, by the way, it's kind of interesting because guess what? The no go knockout mice and no go receptor knockout mice have enhanced ocular dominance plasticity in adults. Hey, teacher, oh. Again, yeah. Yeah. So the question is really, like, what's that thing there, the peptide, right? And no, the answer is nobody knows. So you can make certain assumptions. So, um, so the neuronal MHC absolutely has to be loaded with a peptide <coughs> because uh, it can't get onto the cell surface unless it's folded properly. And it's also known that if you, uh, in, in cultured neurons, if you add exogenous peptides, they can be loaded onto class one. Okay, so it doesn't tell you what the peptides are that are present normally. By the way, the peptides are generated uh, in the proteasome. So the peptides are probably a reflection of protein degradation in neurons, just as they are everywhere else in the body. So there's no reason to think there's something different there. The interesting thing is, would the receptors in the nervous system um, exploit the diversity of peptides that get presented? And if it's mostly the innate immune receptors present, then it's not like the T cell receptor. So there might be some specificity, 
but there isn't going to be the diversity you would expect from recombination generated by the, you know, TCR, I mean, TCR recombination, right. So nothing is known, and it's a really fun kind of area to think about. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Do they have abnormal pruning? Um, and I don't, think <clears throat> I don't think people have looked at that level of resolution, honestly. Um, there's some work, I think, that suggests that um, in Golgi studies that they may actually have fewer spines. But, you know, every time you read a paper where somebody says they're fewer, then you read another paper and they say that they're more. So I think it's going to, you know, it, one now has to really, I think, um, when they, so what's happening now is because the MHC class one locus has become very interesting, they're doing um, high density uh, fine sequencing through the locus to, to actually try to identify where these changes are and whether they're in a coding or non-coding region. And um, there's a huge project at the Eli Broad Institute at MIT. And I think once we know more about uh, what the functional changes are, it's gonna be much more informative than to make, you know, to make either mice models or even human, maybe IPS models. Yeah, you know, that would be a good question, whether they have normal, they do have abnormal, there's certain abnormal visual properties, uh, people who have schizophrenia, but I don't know if binocularity is one of them, but that's a good one. And you sort of, you know, you would think that maybe even there, you would see differences in their LGN layering, but nobody's looked, right? <laughs> so. Well, you can do, but you could do MRI, you know, fMRI. But I agree, funicularity, just doing depth stuff. Yeah, yeah. Can we do Michael? Yeah. Yeah, so one thing I think that Mikhail's thinking is, so in where people have studied some of the other MHCs, it's known that some of them are really important for, for, uh, for trafficking. And, uh, you know, and also, obviously, they're important because as they traffic and go into the cell, they get loaded with peptides and then they come back out. There's also uh, some nice studies showing that some of the non-classical MHCs um, are important for the trafficking of other types of receptors, right? So right now, here's the way we're thinking about this is that these MHCs are somehow important. They're regulating deadhesion because basically, what if the if the if MHCs are present, then synapses can be eliminated. And to eliminate a synapse, you have to deadhes you know you have to actually weaken adhesion and remove. And uh, so how that happens and whether it involves either the rece a receptor or just uh, trafficking you know, to the membrane and other, but other adhesive, you know, interactions, we don't know. And for a lot of these questions, I think actually now going into some in vitro systems, so we're trying to develop really good expression constructs to really look in vitro. But honestly, I feel like, you know, you have to start in vivo because otherwise you could find all the stuff in, vi in vitro and not know which of it is important. Can you do a spectroscopy of the Yeah, so that you mean like uh, any one of them, right? <coughs> yeah, you yeah can just do both. Yeah, well, it would be a nice yeah, gain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be a nice gain of function experiment. And I think what we're going to do first, those we're actually already starting to do in vitro, just to start with. Partly out of, because we just can't afford it <laughs> in terms of the mice. But also, we, we would predict that that would actually generate, if anything, more you know, synapse elimination in vitro then. Yes, yeah? then we we'll see the opposite effect of yeah. the knockout, so it will be another kind of... Absolutely, so it'll be really nice, yeah. And my yeah. second question yeah. is, do, do you see, uh, I don't know about the 
immunology of mice. So are there MHC differences between strains? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I didn't go into the gory details. Well, you can if you want, but that's also kind of a nightmare, right? So we've been really careful because this is the point. It's a great question. So because if you go, if you want your strain of mouse from Jack's, from the lab, you go, you know, and you get your black six mouse or you get your, you know, C, C whatever, your 129 or whatever, right? What makes them different, different is the MHCs that they express. That is the strain difference, right? So, by the way, pay attention. If you want to do studies here, get the, you better make sure you study the mice that express the MHCs that you care about. So in all of our experiments, we're doing them on a black six background. That was the B, the KB or the DB. Everything is black six because some of those strains don't express either K or D, so you have to really look at it. The, you know, I sometimes fantasize that the behavioral differences that are well known between mice may actually have to do with the MHC class 1 expression. But then you make your mice, which are on black six pure backgrounds. Right. If you, and I saw that you have the phenotype only in the knockout, not in the actual cycle. So if you make them with wild type black six, you will rescue the phenotype. And you will make them with 129, you will not rescue it. I'm not sure. I have to go look at which are which. But it's a, it's a breeding nightmare, honestly. So I'd much rather rescue personally by putting back the one I want into the strain I'm working on. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> it should work. So I think it's time. And uh, we'd like to thank uh, Carla very much again.